Welcome to Join Our Town. I'm your host, Lorenzo Martin. We're going to be talking about being involved in a car accident. We want to welcome our very special guest, James Laurel from the Elzell Shinora Law Firm. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Give us a little more background information about yourself and what do you do? Yeah, most definitely. I'm an attorney. Um, I'm licensed in the states of Alabama and Florida, uh, and I run a law firm, Alexander Shinar and Associates. That's great. That's great. What are some of the um, issues when, when people are uh, now mandatory to have car insurance? Yeah, so, you know, in the state of Alabama and the state of Florida, it's different. Um, and every state has different insurance systems. Uh, statutes are on the books to dictate what a driver on the roads in a given state who lives in that state, registers their car, et cetera, in that state, have to have uh, in terms of coverage. Um, I'll speak to Alabama first. Uh, Alabama requires a minimum limit for liability insurance. Uh, liability insurance is a coverage that will cover you in the event that you damage somebody else or their property um, for the extent of the damage done to them or their property, up to $25,000 in coverage. That's the minimum mandatory limit. Um, so obviously that is what we call a third party coverage. Um, it takes care of someone else, not you. Um, in Florida, the obligation is wholly different. Uh, the obligation is to carry PIP insurance, uh, personal injury protection insurance, uh, so that you can look to your own carrier, the insurance that you maintain to cover yourself in the event that you're involved in an accident that causes you injury, regardless of who was at fault. So Alabama fault-based system, uh, Florida has a no-fault system, and the coverages are a bit different. But uh, the minimum mandatory, regardless of what state you're in, should be complied with or you shouldn't be driving. Ultimately. Right, right. Being it is mandatory. Uh, we still find a lot of people that are not actually getting auto insurance. Yes, yeah, tons. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, front end cost, um, new situations, whether it be a new car or uh, a loss of a job, change in family circumstance, etc. Um, but, and this is the important thing to note when you're talking about a lack of insurance and how that can affect you know, the prosecution of a personal injury case or a property damage claim, uh, it's get uninsured motorist coverage. So just like liability or PIP, as I was explaining earlier, there are so many different types of coverages. Insurance companies want you to buy a ton of them, um, and one that is less costly than others that are commonly purchased in addition to the minimums uh, is uninsured motorist coverage. Also comes with underinsured motorist coverage uh, to fix the situation or to help resolve a situation where someone has a minimum mandatory limit, but they don't have more than that. So you get uninsured or underinsured motorist coverage in the event that somebody hurts you or your property and they're not covered by a liability policy um, or they don't have enough to cover the damage done to you. So right now, if you're hit by a, a individual without insurance, what would be the process and procedure for that recommended to the driver? Well, yeah, so the first thing you should do is definitely further the case through that adverse party first. Um, now, whether that means going against them individually is another question. But often at the scene of an accident, an officer will take down information that is often old card. Um, the person doesn't have the card. The officer's moving quickly, no insurance, et cetera. So you want to push and make sure that the person who hits you, um, who claims to be or is, who is documented as uninsured, in fact is uninsured first. Then what you would do is look to your carrier. Um, I get a call a ton, a ton of the times where someone says, listen, I have full coverage. Well, you know, there is no full coverage you know, that an insurance company sells. It's most of the time when someone says that referring to, I have the minimum mandatory. Okay. You know, full coverage could you know, be stated to mean the hundreds of coverages that an insurance okay. company offers. Um, but if you don't know if you have uninsured or underinsured motorist coverage, you contact your carrier and ask the coverages that you have. You can review your, your uh, insurance card. Sometimes the abbreviations for the coverages you have are, are on that card. So look to the other party to fix you first. And if you can't get them to or get their insurance company to, contact your carrier. All right. So if someone is in an accident, is it best to keep it within those insurance companies? Is it always best to get, a, to get an attorney? Well, I, I obviously you know, am a uh, personal injury attorney who deals with car accidents all the time. So I believe there's a ton of value in approaching an attorney for legal services. And let me touch on that. Why? Um, you know, a lot of people think, okay, this is relatively simple. You know, I contact the insurance company. I tell them this person hit me in the back and I'm going to be taken care of. A lot of that is because they tell you that they're going to take care of you. And that's one of the first tricks they pull. Um, when you're speaking to them at first, it's all nice. You know, oh, don't worry, Mrs. Jones, we're going to take care of your car. You know, if, you, if you're hurt, we're going to take care of your medical bills. You know, wait, you know, a couple months and see what their tune is then. Once you've handled the case yourself and potentially harmed it, unknowing to you, uh, uh, to an extent that would decrease their liability if an attorney then got involved. So uh, what I tell people all the time is, listen, contact an attorney after you're in an accident and get the emergency medical care you need just to check 
at first, you know, if the attorney engages you and has a conversation, this is relatively simple, it's small, you know, I think you could take care of it yourself. It's a, that's advice I provide all the time. Yeah. Um, but the vast majority of instances suggest that if you don't hire an attorney, you're not going to get the full value for your property damage, that they're not going to pay you for the medical bills that you either incurred because you need it or they're not going to provide you the capital to go out and seek the treatment that you need. You know, it becomes a financial scenario for a ton of folks. Um, and at the end of the day, if an attorney is involved, the value that will be obtained just based on the way the insurance companies handle their claims, their systems, their computer systems, an attorney repped file, as we call it, is more valuable to them than a non-attorney repped file. Right, right. So when you're in an accident, what are some of the biggest mistakes that people make initially in that accident? They contact the insurance company and for the other sure carrier so. and start talking to them. And, uh, you know, your producer and I were having a conversation earlier on about the dangers of even contacting your carrier. Now, most insurance policies, I won't speak universally, but they have provisions in them that dictate if you're in an accident, you have to contact your carrier uh, or it voids the agreement based on lack of compliance with the cooperation clause. Um, but when you're speaking to your carrier, I advise my clients, listen, just tell them you're in an accident. Comply with the clause, then contact an attorney or contact an attorney first so that we can make that communication for you um, and begin addressing the scenario in a way that takes into account all the facts, the potential liability, et cetera. Um, in addition to speaking to the insurance company too early, we often see you know, somebody not seek the medical treatment that they need right away based on either logical, practical, or uh, uh, financial restraints. So, hey, I was just in a car accident. I live in the middle of the country. Um, we had one car in the family. That car has been destroyed and is non-operable. Um, how do I get to work? If I'm not going to work, you know, how do I feed my family? If I'm unable to feed my family and get to work, obviously I'm not going to be as concerned with seeking medical treatment, even though I need it. Mm -hmm. um, an attorney can assist with that. You know, well, in, in certain states, we have the ability to enter into agreements where the uh, a medical treatment is provided on a lien or a letter of protection basis. The doctor says, listen, you know, come here, seek the treatment that you need, and a lien or a, uh, a letter of protection will govern the direction of the money once it comes in off the settlement. So it's almost like an advanced medical care. Um, if you don't get the necessary treatment on the front end of a case, again, your case will devalue itself based on your actions. So if you don't contact an attorney, they're gonna get the better hand right off the bat, and you're gonna put yourself in a position where you're kind of feeding into their system. Um, you don't want to speak to them and you, and you need to contact your doctor. Um, beyond that, you know, there are an innumerable number of things that people could do better. Uh -huh. So, you know, well, I didn't take pictures at the scene of the accident because of this. You know, I, I wasn't able to. I was severely injured. They life flighted me out, you know, from the scene. You obviously can't stick around and tell the police this is what happened, you know, in a disputed liability incident. So document at the scene of the accident, get the treatment that you need afterwards, and allow us to communicate with the uh, insurance companies. Now, for his documentation, is it good and, and recommended that you actually take pictures or take any notation or just trust your officer to gather all the information and divide it between the two? I mean, I, I would say trust your officer to the extent that you can trust anyone, right? Meaning, you know, I, I maintain the philosophy, no one's going to do, you know, for you better than you will. Sure. Um, so if you want to uh, uh, make sure that you're protecting yourself to the fullest extent possible, document everything. You know, I have a saying, the more evidence, the better, and the best evidence is the best. You know, so evidence is, is, is a corpus. It's a body of, of facts uh, that are presented and at times opinions that are presented to prove X or Y. You know, if you have one document, um, that document may be more powerful than 15 pieces of documentation, but give them all to me, get as many as you can, we'll evaluate them and have a selection, you know, of, of things that will further the points we're trying to make. Um, without the pictures, without testimony by an eyewitness or at least a... Uh, a hearsay opinion of the officer as expressed in a police report, because that's all a police report is, is hearsay evidence, not admissible in a court of law, uh, you're not going to be in as good a position possible. Some cases are easier, obviously, than others in terms of proving you know, certain uh, facts or circumstances, but why take that chance? Most of the time you don't know that uh, when things are occurring. So, you know, camera phones, recorders on those phones, uh, audio recorders uh, allow you a lot of abilities that we didn't have you know, 10 years ago. Right. Um, so use them in the event that you need to document things in uh, uh, anticipation of a legal case. So if a person is injured, of course, if you're injured, we, we, we hope that uh, you can make it to the hospital or anything that make it not life threatened. But if you're injured, not sure, or you're hurting or not, should you go take an ambulance or go to the hospital? Yes, I mean, you know, and that's a lot of times based on the medical nature of your injuries. 
So when you're involved in a car accident case, a lot of times, if it's not a traumatic injury such as a, a, a broken arm or a broken leg or something like this, you'll sustain a soft tissue injury, which is traumatic in the way that we define it as opposed to degenerative, but it's not something that people see as, oh, this is terrible. Well, those types of injuries don't necessarily present themselves until about three to five days after the accident. So it's very, very common that we'll get a call from somebody who, for reasons you know, that I can understand, wanted to stay at the scene and take pictures, et cetera, mm -hmm. didn't go to the hospital right. after the accident to get checked out. And that's completely fine because often they don't even feel it. Your adrenaline is rushing. You know, you're in a, a situation where your focus is dedicated to something else. Um, and by the time that you start coming around to feeling it, you, know, you think, did I wait? Did it? No, you probably weren't experiencing you know, it originally when the accident happened. Three to five days later, the soft tissue injury presents itself and you should seek treatment. So the advice I like to give my clients is listen, you know, get the medical care and treatment that you need. Every case is different um, and only a doctor can tell you how, what it means based on how you feel. So, you know, I can tell you this is what I see, but I'm not a doctor, you know, so it sounds like a soft tissue injury, but we don't know unless and until you get checked out. It's also important from a, an evidentiary standpoint. Again, a doctor is the only one who can testify to medical matters. You know, I mm. can't get up there. You couldn't get up there right. unless you have, you know, certain degrees and certifications, et cetera. Um, and so w without, you know, seeking the necessary treatment, I tell my clients, you're not going to get, you know, the money for that care that you would need for that care, which, again, creates an, an issue. You know, if I don't have the finances, you know, how am I going to go pay the hospital? You know, hospitals charge a lot of money these days based on insurance rates that they get from BCBS or Medicare or whomever else. And if you're in an accident case and you don't have insurance and you get a $12,000 bill, you know, across your desk or in the mail, you know, you're shocked. Um, you're thinking, should I have gone to the doctor? Should I have taken that $1,000 ambulance ride? If you contact an attorney, you know, the answer is yes. If you don't, they very, you know, well may get the better of you because now you're in dire straits. You know, you're 13 thousand dollars underwater in an accident that you didn't cause and you're trying to deal with one of the largest companies in the world it it gets difficult yes, yeah. well thank you so very much we thank y'all for joining us and joining our town we ask you to make sure that you have your mandatory insurance and insurance is to protect you and also protect those that are on the road with you so once again thank you for joining us on jar in our town for the millions living with copd breathing becomes a struggle copd is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease you may have heard of it as chronic bronchitis or emphysema. Over time, you feel like you're breathing through a straw. It's the fourth leading cause of death in the U.S., and it took my grandmother. If you're over 35 and have ever smoked, you could be at risk. Good news is, you can improve your symptoms. I'm Danica Patrick, and I drive for COPD. Join the movement at driveforcopd.com. Take our screening questionnaire today and talk to your doctor. This is Alabama Governor Robert Bentley. Texting and driving just don't mix. Did you know that you're 23 times more likely to be in a crash if you're texting while driving? No text is worth risking your life or the lives of others. Alabama law prohibits texting while driving. Don't risk your safety, fines, and points on your license. Remember, safe driving starts with you. We're working towards zero deaths on our highways. So drive safe, Alabama. Welcome to Join Our Town. I'm your host, Lorenzo Martin. We have attorney James Laurel with the Alexander Shenora Law Firm, and we were talking about many businesses does not give back to the community. If you can kind of expound on what, what help and assistance that you all give to the community uh, that you serve. Yeah, I mean, um, first I'll kind of touch on, you know, why we do what we do in the community. Um, you know, there are two ways to look at this. Um, the first way is the old traditional business concept of if you give back to the community, the community will give to you. Um, a lot of what we do is based on that philosophy. It's a good philosophy. I believe in it. We apply it. Um, that being said, over recent years, there's been a development of a thought process related to a term social entrepreneurship. Um, and what that term is designed to address is a situation where a business engages in uh, 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 a, a developmental structure that suggests if we invest in the community that it's better for our bottom line. And most social entrepreneurships do that in a way that is built into their actual business. So we provide legal services, an argument could be made that we are a traditional social entrepreneurship, you know, as the definition reads. Yeah. But most, most of the time it is a, a situation where they're creating, I'll give you an example, a, a new form of light in communities in, you know, uh, lesser developed areas of the world, Asia, Africa, et cetera, where they don't have access um, to lamps and, and electricity all over the place. Um, if they're using one form of lighting that is dangerous um, and we have the option to 
you know, in a, 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 an entrepreneurship model where you can make it a, a profitable business by providing an alternate source of energy and therefore light um, to areas of the world that need that. Um, you're going to provide, a, you know, a, a benefit to the population that can really change lives and generations, but also the company can make money, which suggests under the, under the theory that they're going to keep doing it more and more. Um, but what we do, uh, and so we have a little bit of that because I believe in those ideas, but what we do really is look for areas that support us as a business, and we look to support them in areas you know, unrelated to the provision of legal services, um, whether that be through charitable uh, sponsorships um, for religious events or otherwise, or if it's you know, educational uh, objectives. Um, you know, we focus a lot on athletics with young children. Um, because we like uh, to believe that a structured competitive environment um, is what makes a person ready for the workplace uh, in the real world. Um, and so not only are we creating a positive potential customer, um, we're creating a, a, a person uh, in that they're going to be able to interact with the communities that we live and work with uh, or work in in a much more positive way so that later on down the line, you know, we hope there's less work to do. Um, you know, but right now there's plenty to be done in all the areas that we practice. We practice in four states and multiple cities in, in all these states. So we know what trends are in terms of, you know, social issues that need to be addressed or social objectives that, you know, have a, a, a definable purpose with a concrete, you know, objective that can be accomplished. We get contacted a lot, you know, because we have these, these philosophies and, and the good thing is the word spreads um, with, you know, uh, presentations or ideas. Um, but we, you know, vet them on a very selective basis, you know, to look at what is best for our spend in that way so that we can continue to do so. Um, you know, is it going to yield the benefit in the young people that we're looking to see? Who's leading that group of young people? Uh, you know, and then from the business perspective, you know, at the end of the day, are, 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 is that group of people noticing what we're doing, et cetera? And, and luckily, you know, we've made good decisions and invested in the right people, and those people are doing positive things, and, you know, we're seeing a business benefit. So, All right. so why do you think so many businesses are blind to actually being involved and in, in helping and assisting the community in which they serve? It's a, a traditional thought process. Uh, you know, we don't want to spend money on that because that's not going to buy me more widgets that I can then sell to these people at, you know, why price with a margin that, you know, is attractive to me. Um, you know, what, what we try to do is, is to see long term. Um, a lot of businesses operate in the short term. If you have a public entity, for example, you know, a publicly traded corporation, they're literally accountable to their stockholders on a quarterly basis. So it's hard to tell a stockholder, you know, we want to spend, you know, X number of dollars on an organization that we can almost guarantee is not going to bring us back any type of profit um, in this next three months. And therefore, your stock price isn't going to be positively affected by it. Um, and that, you know, makes CEOs make bad decisions in terms of, at least in my opinion, long term strategic objectives. We get away from that. Okay. Name some of the things as an involvement in the community that you enjoy uh, being a part of and assisting in the community. Yeah, yeah. I, it, it, like I said, I, you know, we're heavily involved in athletics, but at the same time, you know, people who have the ability to influence a lot of folks, politicians and whatnot, um, we like to support. Um, you know, there are, you know, things that can only be achieved through certain avenues. And if those avenues aren't pursued in the right way or if you could become blind to the fact that they're important, the institutions, um, then you're not going to achieve what you want to achieve. Why do you think it's so important to build this practice and to encourage this practice with other businesses to stay involved? Because there's a lot of work to be done. Yeah. And ultimately, a lot of our capital in America and other places you know, resides in the business community, um, whether that's from an ownership and leadership standpoint or the entity itself. So without the proper investment um, by the people who hold the most coin, if you will, um, you're not going to see the type of return in you know, the areas that need to be addressed as you would if, if the right folks got involved. Right. Are you seeing a result in the uh, system that you're giving? I know everybody want, to, want an exchange to see the change that they're attempting to make in the community. Yeah. Is that happening? Yeah. Um, and, and most importantly, on the level of the base uh, objective of the organization that we're supporting. So, you know, we have an opportunity this year to uh, be involved with the high school football team. Uh, and that football team saw, you know, success that they hadn't seen in recent years. Um, and we would like to believe, and you know, their leadership on the team tells us that that has a lot to do with the 
uh, uh, standing that they gave themselves, the importance that they uh, saw in themselves by having a corporate sponsor. They felt like college or professional athletes. And, and if you make you know, you know, a person, especially a young person, feel a certain way, they're going to begin to act a certain way. Um, and the team that we got to sponsor, just as one example, you know, really lived into that standard, and, and we were pleased. That's great. That's great. What are the other aspects of uh, one of your involvements in the community that you want to express and let us know about? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I like to look at uh, the provision of our services as a, a, a community investment in and of itself. And let me, let me explain. You know, a lot of lawyers who do what I do, we work on a contingency fee, which means, you know, we're not going to be paid on a case unless we're successful in getting an, an X number of dollars and then we calculate a percentage. Um, that suggests from a business decision making standpoint that some cases are too small, you know, that we don't want to take on this matter. You know, we like to look at it as, okay, you know, is it a good legal claim? You know, we're not going to further claims that are, aren't viable in terms of the basis that they have in the law, but we're not going to necessarily make business decisions in terms of, is it worth my time? You know, I, I don't believe in what they call opportunity cost, right? Where, well, if we're working on that person's case, we can't, why not? You know, let's increase our competencies, our capacity, try to find a way to help the people that need and deserve help. Because in the future, again, from a business standpoint, those people will remember that and they'll come back and they'll bring their business back. Um, that's only one way that we can touch folks, though. You know, so all the other things that we do through the community investment, you know, are important. But ultimately, we then like to prove if they come to us, you know, what we're able to do, willing to do from a legal standpoint. Right. Would you entertain or are you possibly working with other businesses to combine your efforts? to make a greater impact in the community? In fact, yes, and, uh, and recently, because we've seen so much success with community involvement, um, we saw other businesses kind of pop up, you know, similarly, in similar events, and we were always on the same event or the same organization, you know, helping each other out. Let's have a conversation, you know, if we have a similar focus, uh, we can make, you know, more happen together than we can if we're working against each other. That being said, there, there are so many people who, st who still need to follow. You know, so whereas I like seeing the same person, it's tough to see the same person all the time, the other person, because uh, that means that there, you know, isn't as much involvement as there should be. Right. So what are some of the things that you are excited about from the results of, of being involved in the community? Yeah. Um, you know, we have the potential to influence a lot. Um, so, again, we're in the legal community, we're a business, and we're successful in those areas. But when you start trending into education, um, when you start uh, trending into doing things that attempt to raise test scores um, through incentive programs or, or otherwise, um, again, you're going to raise you know, a, a better community of folks who are more educated and have a better chance at, at what they deserve to take advantage of. Um, but also, like I said, the political structure. You know, we live in the southeast. You know? um, politics down here are pretty well defined. Um, and it's important uh, to me and to our firm and the attorneys who work at it that we have a hand on the way things go. Um, so whether it's you know, reading bills and legislation that's proposed at, at the State House um, when they're in session and making sure that you know, there's no funny stuff going on, um, or it's you know, literally getting involved in the campaign process um, for certain candidates who have similar thought processes and beliefs. You know, I have a, uh, a firm administrator at our firm who uh, manages uh, many different campaigns. And it's one of the ways that I got to know her. Um, and she's been successful in doing it in a way that, that meshes um, you know, her role with the firm, but then her role with those campaigns, and obviously, therefore, because of both the community. Um, and, and that's a, an exponential impact uh, that can be obtained. So you know, we have some irons in the fire right now that you know, I won't speak to, but we have you know, exciting projects in most of the markets that we're in. That's great. That's great. What about, I don't know if you're doing it or would consider doing it, some internship where people can actually, our young people can actually get involved and get excited about like, maybe being a potential lawyer or working for a law firm or things right. along that line. It's uh, interesting you say that today uh, because someone who is now a full-time employee at the firm um, started as an intern at our firm, um, a summer intern, you know, uh, coming home from college, wanted a job, um, and the firm administrator who I refer to brought her under her wing, and now she, you know, handles a lot of our, our business for us. Um, so I obviously believe in that process. I think it's important in, in today's day and age to get real world experience. Like I was saying before, the education system, you know, K through 12 or, or whatever they refer to it as, is important. But the real world's a bit different, and, and uh, what you learn in school isn't always going to carry you through the day. Um, and if you have the experience carrying yourself through the day, carrying other people through the day, building a team, developing your professional acumen, um, you're a much more attractive candidate. Um, so for all intents and purposes, if you think about an internship program, I, I, I sometimes refer to it with my business colleagues as a farm team. You know, you, you, you have talent, then you, you, you bring that talent up 
not only through a system, so they have experience, but through your system. Um, and so they understand the, the, the values the, the organization has. They understand the people. Um, they can be more effective right away. So not only is it a good opportunity, regardless of what happens thereafter, it can be a real opportunity in the immediacy to secure employment. So, you know, for young children or, or for employers, you know, implement an internship program or take advantage of one because there's value there. Right, right. Would you, and I know in your busy schedule, be open to entertaining, visiting our, our schools and possibly going to some of our facility where our young people are so they can feel in touch and get opportunity to get a meet someone that's active in their community and also as a, as a lawyer? Most definitely. I mean, uh, you know, schools are where the kids are, you know, hopefully. Um, so when we have the opportunity to go, I, I, can, I can remember numerous occasions, whether it be on a Saturday or a Friday night, where we, we, we go see the children where they've decided to come. You know, a football game, uh, a speech on a Sunday, talking about a current community event, because in my opinion, the engaged folks are those who are looking to seek more engagement, and we can really make a difference there for providing that, that vehicle to kind of get them over the hump, as opposed to necessarily just going out and shotgunning approach, you know, sourcing all students, right? Some students haven't made that, that jump yet, and we try to get, you know, to those types of um, individuals who have certain difficulties as well, but, you know, we're looking to, to find people who are ready and prepared to take the assistance that they need. Um, we've gotten involved in an organization recently that, that you know, it, it t tends to young, young, young children um, and brings them up through their own system. Um, and so we're beginning to, to be able to see how, through a mechanism, that we can, you know, assist people from young, the youngest age to, to the high school age. So going into schools, yes, um, but we like to go other places as well. Um, it's all about where the best and, and, and uh, folks are and, and, and who's in the most need. Right. So if you could briefly tell us, what would you be mostly excited about from your time here and, and what you've done so far and your accomplishments in the community? Yeah, most definitely. In, um, in Mobile specifically, in Mobile, Alabama, I'm most proud of uh, what we've been able to do with Mardi Gras. Um, we've had a number of different relationships that have uh, allowed us to have an influence from a political and otherwise standpoint um, to kind of change the way that it's perceived. Uh, and, and not only am I proud of it, uh, but I'm excited about it uh, because I have big plans for it in the future. That's good. That's good. But once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to Joy in Our Town. I'm your host, Lorenzo Martin. You stay tuned. We'll be right back, and you have a great and wonderful day.